Uh, I want to <clears throat> tell, uh, but we start with a story. This, this was actually, I preached on this scripture 15 years ago. It was the first sermon I preached in a church. And, um, and so now 15 years later, um, I'm going to preach on the same thing, but I'm preaching a whole different message. It's amazing how you can read the same scripture and you just see so much stuff in there because that's what the word, the word is eternal. It changes our lives. You sometimes have read one scripture over and over, and then you sort of like, hey, three years later, suddenly the Holy Spirit just shows you some stuff. Um, have you read that before? You know, suddenly you realize like, wow, I've read this story so many times, but I'm actually reading it as if it's the first time. And uh, if you're struggling to read the Bible, read as if you were there. It makes life much easier. Read as, as if you were in the story. Picture yourself as being Zacchaeus in the tree. <laughs> Don't read it like it's a foreign story out there. Picture yourself like that. I've got a bit of an imagination, you know? So, so I liked picturing what did things smell like and what, it, what did it look like and how big was the tree and how tall was Zacchaeus because he wasn't very tall, you know? But um, praise God, I'm going to Nepal because in Nepal, I'm a very tall man. I like that. Many people look up to me over there. Okay, so Luke chapter 19. This is... This is probably a turning point in Jesus' ministry. He's going into Jerusalem. Uh, there are many challenges. Some people said a lot of stuff about him. A lot of stuff started to happen. And so, so now he comes here to Bethany and, and the Mount of Olives or the Mount of Olivet, however you want to pronounce that. Every nation will probably pronounce it a little bit, dip, bit different. Um, and listen to this in verse 29. And it came to pass when he drew near to Bethpage, I don't know how the United States of America people of Bethany and Bethany at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his, um, the, the free state people will say Olivet, Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village opposite you where as you enter, you will find a colt, that's a donkey, on its which no one has ever sat, loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you losing it there? That you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt or the donkey? And they said, The Lord has need of him. And then they brought them to Jesus. And they threw their own clothes on the colt and they said to Jesus, and they sat Jesus on him or set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread out their clothes on the road. Then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, let's just first stop there. You know, it's an ordinary story. Jesus comes up, now he's going into Jerusalem, he's got a, there's some stuff on his heart, there's some stuff that he's going to accomplish there, and now suddenly, he says to them, go to this little village next door, and go into the village, and tell them to get this donkey, just get the donkey, and come, when they ask you, say come, now it's, it's you can sort of read over it, and think like, well, that's amazing, but the story is actually amazing if you think of it that these, the, the owners of the donkey, imagine somebody walks up to you and say, hey, um, we need to get your car right now. And then um, and you say, why do you need the car? And then they say, well, Jesus needs it. And then you just give them the keys and there they go. It, it, it isn't a by chance story. If you read into the story, you'll begin to discover a lot of things. That there were people ready whose hearts were prepared for Jesus to come. People that knew that if Jesus would ask something of them, he would give it to them. And, and so they were just free to, to be able to give, but much more, it was a specific donkey. It was a donkey that nobody ever sat on. Now, if you understand the culture, it is a massive thing <laughs> because they use donkeys for everything, and especially for riding from one village to another from place to place. So it is almost impossible for a donkey to be around that has never been sat on. So there we have our first miracle of the story that somebody probably trained that donkey from very young because they heard God said it, that there's going to be a master that's going to ride this donkey, but you need to prepare that donkey for, its coming, for the master's coming. There's three sermons in that. <laughs> because... Because I wonder, I don't know how old the donkey gets, you know, but how old that one was. But it was, it takes a while for a donkey to get to the size where you can sit on it. And so here these people were ready to receive Christ and whatever Christ asked of them, they were prepared for it. So whenever God starts to move, whenever God is doing something, there's always a group of people that are ready, that have made provision for his coming. You can see it right through scripture. 
whether it was the angels pitching when Jesus got born or whether it was Simeon and, and, and these guys that were praying, you know, the moment when the baby came and, and, and Mary brought the baby in, into the temple, then he just marveled and he said, I've been waiting my whole life for the Messiah to come. I've been living to see this little baby. And then he just sees a baby in front of him and he rejoices. <laughs> You read of many of these people that Scripture sort of just refers to. But, but God always, when God is about to move, there's a people that are ready for that. They've heard from God. It's not by chance. God doesn't move by chance. God doesn't gamble and he doesn't play Russian roulette with us. When he moves in your life, he's prepared people. Let me tell you a story. Last weekend, um, we were in Namibia with the NAM men's camp. And um, when Stephen Lungu, many of you that were at the men's camp this year, uh, was there, and, and he, he told a very interesting story, but something that made me think so much and so amazing. And now I can't remember all the details, but, but this is basically how it went. He said that, you know, those of you know his story, he, he preached it here one Sunday evening, that he went into a tent to blow up the tent with, with um, a lot of, uh, of his gangsters in, in Zimbabwe because of, you know, just hating white people and hating a lot of stuff and being against the system. And so through a process, God started to convict him. He lived like 15 years under a bridge, and he was really the top gangster and going for it. He wanted to blow up a bank. And then as he went in, God's conviction came over him. And I still remember, you see, I still remember the story. He said he was sitting there, and then every time when the preacher preached, he pointed a finger, but it looked like the poor finger was pointing at him all the time, you know. He says later, later he's going to catch out the preacher, because every time the preacher showed like this, then he went like this, you know, sitting at the back of the tent. And, um, well, eventually God saved him, and God did a, in the tent that evening, God did a, many things. But then he said, years later, he was preaching in a little church somewhere in Durban or Peter Maritzburg, and two old ladies came walking up and said to him, oh, he preached and shared his testimony. And the two ladies came, and the one lady brought a Bible, and she said, Mr. Lungu, do you know what? I think it was 15 years later. Do be as you must help me now. I can't remember the exact number of years. He said, Mr. Mr. Lungu, yeah. Look what we've written in our Bible. Now, this is 20 years or 15 years later when they heard the testimony. They said, we wrote here on the 15th of May, somewhere in May. Lord, you're about to save a gang leader in Zimbabwe in a tent. Save him. These were two old ladies in another country that didn't know anything. And they prayed that that man will be saved. And I was thinking like, wow, God, <laughs> some of us have got grandmas and grandpas, I mean, <laughs> that have been praying for you to be here. You've got no idea. Run, but you cannot hide. <laughs> that praise of your grandmother and grandfather is going to catch up with you. <laughs> but it was such an amazing story of God's faithfulness that in another country, two old ladies that probably can't even walk anymore, they prayed. God put it on their heart to start to pray that God would save a big gang leader in Zimbabwe. They didn't know him. They didn't know about the tent. They didn't, but it's the exact date that he got saved. And they wrote it in their Bible. They came to show him. What a testimony of God knowing every little detail where we are, where we're going. But there's, there's a group of people that God's, God has prepared their hearts. They're ready. And so, so I'm talking tonight about God's visitation. When God comes to visit us, when God comes, it's not always in the way that we think, but there's something in our hearts. We've prepared our hearts. We, have, we are focused. So that the moment when these disciples walk in and they say, we want that donkey, they say, yes. <laughs> A specific donkey. Nobody's ever sat on it. There you go. We've been preparing. Maybe for years. Maybe for months. But at least for years. And this is the beauty of the story. So Jesus comes and says he has need of him. <laughs> Verse 35, then they brought him to Jesus and they throw, threw their own clothes on the colt and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. And as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, so now he's coming over, he's coming over into Jerusalem. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. <laughs> so here the king, they recognize the king and he's coming on a donkey. He's coming with such humility. Philippians chapter 2 talks about it, that Jesus humbled himself to the place of death. The humility, that's what I love about Christ. 
That's what I love about true Christians is they are truly humble. They're not parading and saying, oh, you know, and that's, I, was, I don't know if there's, you know, that's what I don't like. And I'm, I'm, I'm really f- straightforward with you. If you're American here, yeah, please forgive me. But, you know, I struggle to receive stuff out of America <laughs> where people say it's the gospel. It's many times a cultural gospel. Because people parade and now you have to kiss the ring of the prophet because the prophet is so important and ride with your limousine because don't touch this and don't that, you know. People have become so far removed from the heart of Christ. But then when you go into the mountains of India or you go into the mountains and you begin to see, wow, God's church. God's church is moving people all over that are flat on their faces before Jesus. And so this moment when Jesus comes into Jerusalem, these people begin to recognize it. They say, blessed is the king. They throw down their clothes. They throw down the palm branches, which is the, the place of worship. The, you know, they just come to, they exclaim. You can almost see a rumbling of this massive crowd. They're getting excited. They are like, whoa. They're just like, suddenly just all together people are, you know, because yeah, Jesus is coming on a donkey. He's coming into Jerusalem, but it's like, it's not just because it's a little bit of an environment. It's because there have been people that have been waiting for the coming of the Messiah. And suddenly there's people that are desperate. They're crying out with a loud voice. It's, they just burst into worship. Peace in heaven. Glory in the highest. Can somebody say amen? amen. Are you a bit cold tonight? You're very dark. Just out there somewhere. Shake your neighbor and say, hey. That's all you need to say, okay. So it says the whole multitude, everybody started to cry. Oh, and here we go again. (laughs) Verse 39. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, teacher, rebuke your disciples. How could they say this? You're just a teacher. You're just an ordinary man. You're just from around the corner. But it's amazing when the Holy Spirit begins to move. And it's not like just one or two individuals decided we're going to have chant chants for Jesus, throw out our little pom-poms and say pom-pom for Jesus, you know. It's like that moment. It's a prophetic moment. And when God's timing comes, I love what Scripture says, in the fullness of time Jesus came forth, the word was sent. God has got his fullness of time, the moments when God starts to move. And then whether you're ready or not, it doesn't really matter. Those who are ready will receive and worship him. But those who are not, those who are religious, those who are trapped in their way of thinking will not recognize Jesus when he comes. Because here it says, teacher, rebuke your disciples. But listen to what Jesus says. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Whoa. Jesus says, this moment is so huge, that it is so prophetic, that all of the age, all of eternity, has been focusing on what will happen in this time. This is a prophetic thing that's happening. So if you miss it, it doesn't matter even if you miss it. God is not, God is not looking for you. <laughs> he says, because if you're going to be silent, do you know what? The stones will begin to cry out. Because this moment is coming. It's the drawing of all of eternity, all of life is going to come together in what's going to happen the next couple of days here in Jerusalem. And so there will be praise. And if you're not going to do it, do you know what? The stones will cry out. They will, the rocks will cry out. You know, rock and roll, all these other names, it's actually very, it comes from there. They stole it, okay? Made it very negative because the rocks will cry out. I mean, so it says the, the rocks, they will begin to cry out. The king is here. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Everybody else is silent, silent. Don't, you know, just try to, don't just, just be dignified. But I love what Reinhard Bonke says. He says, dignity is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. When God comes, we don't care what other people think or what they say. Some of you are, are too much thinking tonight about, ooh, what if, what if people see me lifting up my hands? So I'll just go like that. We become half mass worshippers. But then they in front of the TV yesterday, when you watch the Stormers or the soccer, you sweared at the ref. You lost it there. You, you went bananas, okay? But in church, give Jesus three fingers at least, you know? Three is a biblical number, but hey, I'm only joking with some of us. But, but that's, that's, you know, God wants to break that 
religion because what you need to see, there's a prophetic thing happening when Jesus comes in. This is what Isaiah prophesied about. This lowly, your king is coming on a donkey. Prophecy is being fulfilled at that moment. And that's the beauty of, of us as Christians is that we are not caught by surprise. God has got a plan and God's prophetic movement is, 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 is moving and he's speaking and he's doing things all across the world. You're not seeing it on television. It's not making news, but what's happening in China and Brazil and nations all across the world, God is moving in a great way. The end time harvest is beginning to, to, to get in. It's not happening in the West. It's not happening in Europe because we've become too intellectual for God. We've become like those Pharisees. Be silent, rebuke these people. Who are they? Because you know, when God starts to move, he's not waiting for you and me. <laughs> It makes you very humble when you start to realize that, that you and I are just a little dot, a little drop in the ocean. God does not need you. He does not need me to fulfill his purposes. You are not doing God a favor by coming to church tonight. He loves it when you come. He loves it when you come to his house. You don't, you're not doing God a favor when you're reading your Bible every day. You're not adding anything to God. But yet he has included you and he has included me in his heart. And he wants us to partake. He wants us to be part of that. Say amen. So now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. You see, it's almost like, wow, what's happening here? Because at this one moment, Jesus has got this massive worship. He's got this moment where he comes into Jerusalem and there's a cry. It's just a spontaneous cry. It's like a prophetic thing that the prophets have prophesied over that your king is here, the Messiah is here. And whether the people say it or not, the, the rocks will cry it out because they understand now there's a change. There's a change of season. There's a change of that moment. And now Jesus goes on and he looks over Jerusalem and suddenly he begins to weep. Suddenly something overcomes over him. And, and now this is what he says. He says, Jerusalem, Eve, you had known, even you especially in this your day. Say, this your day. The things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. So he's looking, he's sitting on the top of Jerusalem, he's looking over Jerusalem, he says, oh, Jerusalem. He's beginning to weep. The, the word is quite a strong word. It's not just a weeping of crying, it's a deep, sorrowful weeping. He's beginning to cry, he's looking out over all these people, and he's beginning, there's something that stirs him inside, and he says, if you only knew this day, if you only would receive who I am, if you only would look at the things that make for your peace, but you cannot see, they're hidden from your eyes. And now he begins to talk about what would happen 70 years after that visitation. He says, for days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children within you to the crown. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another. It was when Jerusalem was invaded 70 years later. So Jesus, it's a really prophetic moment. It's not just a nice riding in. It's not just a nice, he's riding in over Jerusalem and now suddenly he sees he realizes that they're rejecting him. They're not accepting him for who he is. And now he's beginning to prophesy. He's beginning to speak. He's seeing. He's seeing into the future. He says, there will be days when, because of your rejection, because of what's happening, there will be not one stone left upon another. And, and Jerusalem was destroyed to the crown because you did not know the time of your visitation. Because you did not know the time of your visitation. And so, so, so we see this, this amazing thing as it's happening, as people are coming and people are shouting, and, that, and then you see them turn around, suddenly those same crowds that begin to crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. Now, <clears throat> when we look at the story, we need to realize the prophetic significance. And the amazing thing is, is that God is speaking and God is releasing his word and God, God is not silent when it comes to his word. <laughs> he's not silent to say to us what he's been doing and what he is going to do. You can just read the scriptures. It's amazing. Everything that is beginning to happen in the earth, it is, it's advancing. Things are happening like at a speed like nowhere. You know, it's just like <laughs> we are marching in time. And that's why it's one of the most exciting times to live, but also one of the most scary times to live. 
And so just playing church, church, or being part of the crowd is not enough today. <laughs> because if you don't know God's prophetic voice, if you don't know God's voice in your life, you're going to be in trouble because it might be that you and I turn around and we're the same part of that same crowd that next week say, oh, he didn't fulfill the things that we wanted him to fulfill, so we're going to crucify him. Because you know, that's the reason why they crucified. Do you know why Judas betrayed Jesus? Because Jesus was not willing to rule so that Judas could get a cut of the business. <laughs> Those same crowds, do you know what? And that's, that's how, unfortunately, because they didn't understand the scripture, is the, the, those same Pharisees and the Sadducees, they began to see, they always said, look here, there's two messiahs. There's a reigning messiah coming, and then there's a suffering messiah. Isaiah speaks of it, and I think Ezekiel speaks of it, prophecies in the Old Testament. And they said there's two messiahs, but Scripture is very clear that there was only going to be one messiah. And that first one messiah is first going to be a suffering messiah, and then a reigning messiah. He's going to turn, because of his suffering, he's going to reign. And, and so they swapped it around because the Romans were oppressing the Jews, and because of their fear and their oppression, they could not see. And so now they had a false expectation of God. And so that when Jesus didn't do what they said he must do, they crucified him because they said, oh, let's just go and look for another. They wanted Jesus to rule. They wanted Jesus to overtake the Romans. And so that's why even the, the sons of Zebedee, the terrorists, you know, there were some terrorists with Jesus. <laughs> they just came out of place and said, God, call down your fire. Fire, fire, you know, destroy that city. And Jesus says, hey, you don't know. You're not part of this kingdom. You don't understand my heart. But those same people, they wanted Jesus to rule, overtake the Romans, rule and conquer the Romans. And then they crucified him because he didn't do it in the way they thought. 